While the planets get a lot of attention in schools and by space agencies, there are smaller, less known worlds in our solar system that are just as interesting. Four of them are known as the Galilean moons, Jupiter's four largest moons. Considering they are so close together, they are fascinating because they are so different. You have a volcano moon, a moon that has one of the best chances of containing life out of anywhere else that we know of, the biggest moon in the solar system, and an ancient, scarred moon whose surface can be traced back to the solar system's very beginning. I'm Alex Molin and you're watching Aram, and in this video we will go through these special worlds one by one and do a deep dive into what makes each one so unique. By the end of this video, I'm sure you'll understand why they will be the subject of two missions this decade from both NASA and ESA. We'll start with the innermost moon, Io. Io is one of the most curious objects in our solar system, the innermost of Jupiter's big moons. It has plenty of features that set it apart from anything else that we have ever seen, including volcanoes, aurora, and a sulfur atmosphere. Let's get to know the context of Io a little better. Io orbits very closely to Jupiter, only 350,000 kilometers above Jupiter's cloud tops. This means from Io's surface, Jupiter would appear 39 times bigger in the sky than our moon. Io orbits Jupiter in only 42.5 hours, compared to our moon's monthly orbit. At some points in its orbit, the tidal bulge on Io is thought to be up to 100 meters. This effect is similar to what we see on Earth with tides caused by the moon, although on Earth, the effect is much more minimal, the tides only usually shifting about 2 meters from high to low. Io is getting 300% more tidal force exerted on it in comparison to our moon. Because of its close proximity to the biggest planet in the solar system, Jupiter, and the other big moons in the system, don't allow the moon's orbit to be less eccentric, meaning Io isn't going to get any respite anytime soon. A day on Io is the same as its orbital rotation, which means that Io is tidally locked to Jupiter, just like we can only see one face of our moon from Earth, only one face of Io can ever be seen from Jupiter. Io is a pretty big moon, although it is the second smallest out of the Galilean moons. It is comparable in size to Earth's moon and shares a similar density, meaning it has a similar amount of gravity. Interestingly, it has the highest density of any other moon in the solar system. One of its many unique features, another, is that it is composed mainly of silicate rock and iron, similar to the terrestrial planets and our moon. In comparison to most other big moons in the solar system, which are made of water, ice, and silicates, Io in fact has the least amount of water of any known body in the solar system. Its core is likely to be made of iron or iron sulfides surrounded by a silicate-rich mantle and crust. The core is not thought to be convecting, though, as no magnetosphere has been detected around the moon. The mantle is thought to be liquid near the crust and is at least 50 kilometers thick. This is where all the volcanism originates, which brings us to perhaps the most interesting part about Io, the hundreds of huge volcanoes all over its surface. Before the 1970s, we didn't know much about Io at all, although telescopes were starting to pick up hints that the moon was devoid of water and that it may have a surface of sulfur. The first mission to see Io in any kind of detail was Pioneer 11, although the quality was still not so great. What it did detect, however, is that Io was made of silicate rock and not water ice, and that it has a thin atmosphere. Pioneer 10 was also meant to take some close-up shots of Io, but this was lost due to Jupiter's radiation interfering with the onboard command system. The radiation Pioneer 10 went through was 10,000 times stronger than maximum radiation around the Earth. The next missions to Jupiter were the Voyager 1 and 2 missions in 1979. Voyager 1 flew by at a distance of only 20,000 kilometers and was able to take some impressive close-ups of Io's surface. What it saw was a remarkable landscape full of vibrant colors and a total absence of impact craters. It found mountains taller than Everest, as well as volcanic pits hundreds of kilometers wide and what looked to be lava flows. Most notable, however, was the presence of plumes coming from the surface. This proved that Io is volcanically active, and it is still the first and only place this has been visibly seen beyond Earth, not including cryovolcanoes. Voyager 1 also confirmed that the surface of Io is covered in different sulfur frosts. This is what gives Io its many spectacular colors. It found that these sulfur compounds dominate the atmosphere. Voyager 2 also saw Io in July of 1979 but was much further away at 1 million kilometers. Although it still saw seven of the nine plumes Voyager 1 saw in March, 
which meant those volcanoes had likely remained active throughout those four months. The really interesting images came about with the Galileo spacecraft that arrived at Jupiter in 1995. The spacecraft wasn't especially designed to only study Io, but it was able to acquire some of the highest resolution images we now have of its surface. Sadly, though, Galileo never worked at full capacity as it had quite a few mechanical malfunctions, which means we could have had even better images had it been fully operational. What it was able to see, though, were plumes from many volcanoes, as well as confirming the volcanoes were erupting sulfur and silicate magma similar to what we have on Earth, except the magma on Io is also rich in magnesium. The surface of Io is spectacularly colorful. The yellow plains are composed of mainly sulfur, the white areas are mainly fresh sulfur dioxide frosts, Towards the poles the sulfur is damaged by radiation which can be seen as the poles appear redder than the rest of the planet. In other places, the color of red are the deposits left by volcanic plumes that reached hundreds of kilometers above it. The most obvious deposit is from the volcano peel, sadly an inactive volcano when Galileo was around. Voyager 1 was able to see a massive plume when it passed by. In this image, the plume is 300 kilometers tall and 1,200 kilometers wide, in other words, roughly the size of Alaska. Interestingly, though, the source of lava flows on Earth are typically the depression you would normally see at the top of volcanoes, but these depressions are not found on high on peaks on Io. Instead, you have these lava lakes with high walls along the outside. Here is the largest volcanic depression on Io, 200 kilometers in diameter. These lakes are directly connected to the lava reservoir below but usually have a thin layer of solidified crust on top. On average, Loki produces 25% of the average heat output of Io, but sometimes the crust on the lava lake sinks back into the lava, causing Loki to produce 10 times more heat than normal. This can especially be seen in one of Io's other big volcanoes, Taster. Normally this area looks like this, but here, the crust is seen falling into the lava lake in this image, where there is just white. The radiant energy from the lava curtain was so intense that the camera only registered white. In 2007, New Horizons used Jupiter as a gravity assist on its way to Pluto. It also used the opportunity to test its equipment. It focused its lens on Io during its flyby, and what it saw was amazing. TV Sure, the volcano I just mentioned, was in full eruption, and the plume could be seen hundreds of kilometers above Io's surface. You can also see other small eruptions around the moon. I must admit, this is one of the most impressive things I've seen of space. Even though the volcanoes tend to be flat, it also has some extremely tall mountains, the highest one reaching 18 kilometers tall. These mountains tend to be completely by themselves, not as part of a ridge or range, although most are not volcanoes. Lava lakes are often found near them, and editing there are faults in the crust near these mountains. Another of the unique aspects of Io is its interaction with the magnetic field of Jupiter. Jupiter has an extremely large and strong magnetic field, and Io orbits within some of the strongest sections. The unusual thing about this interaction is that when particles from some of Io's thin atmosphere and eruptions are lost to space, these particles float in orbit around Jupiter in what is known as a neutral cloud. This cloud can extend far beyond and behind the orbit of Io, but also surrounding Jupiter is something known as a plasma torus a donut of ionized particles that follows the rotation of Jupiter's magnetic field. The plasma torus rotates a lot faster than Io orbits at 70 km per second, compared to Io's 17 km per second, which causes a lot of electromagnetic friction between them. This friction drives a current of about 5 million amps between the planet and moon, making Io the strongest electrical conductor in the solar system. When this current hits Jupiter's atmosphere, it results in Jovian auroras, similar to the aurora seen on Earth but more intense. Io itself also gets auroras along its poles. Io's atmosphere is very thin, though. The temperature of the atmosphere also varies a lot. In the shadow of Jupiter, the atmosphere can collapse and snow out onto the surface. The area around a volcano will be around 700 degrees Celsius, whereas other regions will be minus 150 degrees Celsius. The atmosphere can also be thicker on the side of Io facing Jupiter and can cause huge airfalls where the thin atmosphere collapses onto the surface. These conditions make it very hard to study the atmosphere of Io, even though the Galileo probe and the Hubble Space Telescope have tried to do so many times. Although Io's atmosphere can reach five times higher than the Himalayas, 
the atmosphere itself is too thin to be of any use to humans. The atmosphere is mainly composed of sulfur dioxide anyway, which you would not want to breathe in. Io is a moon of contrast. It has both the hottest and coldest temperatures in the solar system, both the highest mountains and the flattest volcanoes. Its very active volcanic surface was created by the same force that makes the strongest electromagnetic field of any object we know, and we are learning more and more about it all the time. NASA's Juno mission, currently orbiting Jupiter and on an extended mission, is due to get some close-up views of Io in 2023 and 2024. Io is certainly unique, but it is not the only moon that is likely to be visited by future space missions. Each of the four Galilean moons has its own unique characteristics and features that make it worth visiting. For example, Europa has a very smooth and icy surface that is believed to contain more water than all of Earth's oceans combined. This makes it a prime candidate for the search for extraterrestrial life, as water is one of the key ingredients for life as we know it. Callisto, on the other hand, is the most heavily cratered object in the solar system and is thought to have a subsurface ocean. Ganymede, the largest moon in the solar system, is also believed to have a subsurface ocean and is the only moon to have a magnetic field. With so much to learn about these moons, it is no wonder that they are the subject of future space missions. In fact, NASA's Europa Clipper mission is set to launch in 2024 and will conduct detailed reconnaissance of Europa's ice shell and subsurface ocean. Similarly, ESA's Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer mission is set to launch in 2022 and will study Ganymede, Callisto, and Europa in detail. These missions will provide us with valuable information about the conditions and potential habitability of these moons and will help us to better understand the processes that have shaped our solar system.